If you create a blockchain that is able to do 4,500 transactions per second and have millions of users creating millions of tokens, NFTs and smart contracts, the nodes running the network will have to store a ton of data. And unlike historical data that can be pruned, the current state of all the tokens, NFTs or smart contracts can't be deleted in case users want to use them. Nodes only have so much memory, so at a certain point, the state of everyone's tokens and assets will use more data than can be stored on the node's RAM, meaning it will need to be stored on its slower SSD, which can affect the performance of the blockchain. Eventually, the size of the state can even get too big to fit in the SSD, and some smaller nodes may need to shut down, which would reduce decentralization. This problem of state bloat is a big reason why cryptocurrencies like Ethereum limit their transactions per second. Ethereum runs at around 16 TPS, has been around for 7 years, and the size of its state is already over 100 gigabytes, so it's already well above the node's RAM requirements. If you were to ignore the state bloat issue and remove the block size limit, you can run Ethereum at hundreds of TPS on the same nodes, but they made the decision to limit it to 16 TPS to slow down how fast the state grows. Algorand is reportedly able to do more than 4,500 TPS, which is around 280 times more than Ethereum. If Algorand actually had people doing this many transactions, and state was created at a similar rate to Ethereum, Algorand's state size would increase by 100 gigabytes every 9 days. This is well above the participation node's 16 gigabyte RAM requirement, and is already pushing the 100 gigabyte SSD requirement. So maybe Algorand can do 4,500 TPS for a short period of time, but it seems unlikely it would be able to sustain the performance unless users were to do it without creating any new state. In their paper on Vault, Fast Bootstrapping for the Algorand Cryptocurrency, they recognised this future bottleneck and proposed a method for dealing with it. This solution is state sharding. In this video, I'll go through their method of state sharding. However, it is a research topic, so they may have other solutions and not even go in this direction at all. First, let's go over how state is stored in Algorand to then go through how they plan to shard it. Like most cryptocurrencies, Algorand uses Merkle trees to store its state. A Merkle tree works by having each individual piece of state hashed, and then the hashes are hashed together with another hash from the same level, which is then hashed together with another hash on the same level, all the way until you reach a hash root, or the Merkle root. The big advantage of storing state in this format is that now, to prove that a piece of state exists within the Merkle tree, you only need the piece of state and the branch nodes that can create a path leading to the Merkle root instead of needing the entire state. For example, if I'm a node with only a Merkle root, someone can send me a piece of state along with a certain set of branch nodes. Now I can hash the piece of state along with the branch nodes for each level, and if I end up with a final hash that is the same as the Merkle root that I already have, then I can verify that a piece of state does exist within the Merkle tree, even though I don't have the full state myself. Algorand utilises this ability of Merkle trees in its sharding model. In the sharding model they have proposed, all nodes will store and keep the top layers of the Merkle tree and keep them updated. These generally don't use much space. However, for the bottom layers, nodes will be split into shards pseudo-randomly based on their participation key, and each shard will store a different section of the bottom layers of the Merkle tree. If the entire Merkle tree takes up 80 gigabytes, you could have 8 shards, and nodes from each shard would then only need to store roughly 10 gigabytes. If the state size starts getting too big again, more shards can then be added. However, now each node won't have enough information to verify a transaction on its own, and designating nodes to shards using their participation key is something that could be gamed by an attacker to get the majority of a shard, so individual shards shouldn't be trusted. So the second part of Algorand's state sharding model is to require users to create transactions that include enough branch nodes from the bottom levels of the Merkle tree so that each node can use them to create a Merkle proof to verify the state by themselves. Now, if I'm a node who only knows about the state in shard 1, but someone is trying to use state from shard 7, in their transaction, they will have to include enough branch nodes so that I can create a Merkle proof to the piece of state they are trying to use. Because I can create a Merkle proof based on the data in their transaction, I can then verify that the piece of state exists myself without actually having to trust any of the other nodes. This means you don't have to worry about the security of each individual shard so much, 
as all nodes will still verify each transaction. The more important thing is that there are at least some honest nodes in each shard that will make data available so people can create their transactions with the branch nodes in the first place. This sharding model is good because it keeps high security as each node is still able to verify every single transaction by itself without knowing any of the state. However, it does have its downsides which they noted in the paper. Firstly, in the time between when a transaction is created to the time it is being processed by a node, the Merkle tree is likely to have been updated by other transactions, so the branch nodes included in a transaction may no longer be valid, so the node won't be able to verify the Merkle proof. To get around this, nodes will have to recalculate the branch nodes of the transactions themselves with the updated state values from previous transactions, which creates extra work for them. This job can be potentially offloaded to relay nodes though, so may not affect the throughput too much. Another problem is that transactions will have to include a lot of branch nodes, so transaction sizes will be much bigger. In the paper, they gave an example where Algorand State had 100 billion accounts, and for that, you'd need 2.4 kilobytes of branch nodes attached to each transaction, which is almost 11 times the 250 byte transaction size. Bandwidth requirements would have to increase massively. These problems together mean that the number of transactions Algorand could handle would actually go down with the sharding technique, unless they also increased node requirements, as nodes will have more work to download and verify transactions. However, that's only if you're making the comparison right now when Algorand's state size is tiny. If the size of Algorand's state was one terabyte, for example, then the current version wouldn't even run without increasing node requirements, but the sharded model would, so even with the reduced transactions per second, it's better than having something that doesn't function at all. Overall, if Algorand wants to operate at such a high TPS, the state bloat issue is inevitable. Whilst this sharding model does lead to a loss in performance and a more complicated transaction model, it allows them to keep running at a high TPS, even with a massive ever-increasing state size, so it should be worth the trade-offs. They should also have plenty of time to try and improve the method, as it will likely take a while for them to get enough adoption so that users are creating state bloat in the first place. The state bloat issue is the biggest issue for any chain that wants to run at a high TPS, so it will be interesting to see how they eventually solve it. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to catch my future content.